So Chris, I'm really uh, excited to have this conversation. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Greg. Yeah, absolutely, man. So why don't you just take a, a minute or two and, and give us the old elevators p- pitch, a little bit about you, a little bit about your company. Yeah, so my name is Chris Manrino. I'm the founder and CEO at Life Fuel. A uh, little personal background. So as an athlete, pretty much my entire life, played a myriad of sports growing up, but ultimately ended up uh, focusing on football. Walked on to the University of Berkeley um, and ended up uh, – earning a full scholarship after my retro freshman year, went on to set a school record 52 consecutively started games and ultimately being able to pursue my childhood dream of, of playing the NFL. Um, it is really, you know, post uh, athletic career, post NFL, where um, I became uh, more interested in nutrition and, and really started to you know, not just use that for my own performance benefits, but look at you know, nutrition and really the lack of nutrition that exists in standard American diet today. And um, you know, the approach to Life Fuel was really to try to fill those nutrient gaps and make that uh, convenient and getting back to a food first approach to um, nutrition and supplementation, which is largely non-existent in the you know natural food space and uh, supplement space today. Yeah. Now I want to, I want to get really uh, deep into your company and the nu- nutrition side of things. Um, uh, I had a great guest on a couple of weeks ago, uh, named John Madsen, and he, uh, you, you guys might've actually crossed paths in the NFL. He was a tight end, played for the Raiders for, for a handful of years. And he's uh, moved into originally sort of training. And then it's, it's really about performance now. And he talked a lot about, uh, You know, you think about like a LeBron James or you think about these modern day athletes. They have nutritionists. They're sleeping in hyperbaric chambers. They have sports psychologists. I mean, they're, they're doing everything possible, uh, to be at the absolute peak performance of what they're looking to accomplish. And there's no reason that people who are no longer playing sports at that level shouldn't also take that approach to life. Uh, if you're trying to be a CEO, if you're a founder of a new company, if you're trying to get things off the ground, you know, you should look at your life in a similar way. And I know nutrition is, is, you know, just 80% of that in so many ways, just feeding your body with the right, right thing. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in diving more into that, but, uh, let's talk a little bit about Cal, uh, say 50, 52 consecutive games, 54. Yeah, I think it's fifty-two. 52. That's, yeah, that, that's the number. Yeah, that, that's impressive, man. And and as a fullback, yeah. uh, that's I mean, that's probably one of the most physically demanding positions on the field. No injuries. Yeah, I mean, I, I broke my jaw going into my senior season. Um, you know, prior to playing fullback, I was a tailback. Uh, quarterback, linebacker in high school. So I never played fullback. But when I got to Berkeley, um, they just kind of threw me into the position and really got my butt kicked the whole first year of being a redshirt yeah. freshman. You know, I was blocking, you know, future Hall of Famers and, and just, you know, really struggled. Wanted to quit every single day I was there. But just, uh, you know, gritted it out. And we had a new coaching staff, Coach Shepard, came in kind of clean house and everybody had like a a clean slate in terms of showing what they could do. And, uh, going into my red shirt freshman year and summer camp, we were pretty beat up at the tailback position. And, uh, you know, I think the the guy who was slotted to be the starter was not seen eye to eye with the new coaching staff and, and all that stuff. So I got an opportunity to show what I could do. And, um, you know, fortunately I, I was able to earn the starting job, full scholarship and, um, you know, kept pretty healthy throughout, you know, you always, I mean, playing football, there's always something, always injuries, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, the only major injury was the, uh, the broken jaw going into mm-hmm. senior season. And then you're just kind of battling through a bunch of other stuff yeah. you know, constantly. You're never a hundred percent healthy. <laughs> well, I mean, they just wire you up and, and let you go to town. Yeah. So fortunately it was during uh spring football when okay. the injury happened. And so, um, yeah, it was definitely wired up. It was supposed to be wired shut for six weeks. And I think after five weeks, I'd decided to pull all the wires out of my mouth. <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. Nice. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to get it rewired. But yeah, drinking out of a straw mm-hmm. for six weeks, which is not fun when you're trying to maintain and, and really put on weight, right? So um, that was super tough and, and, you know, big setback going into senior year, but still was able to overcome that and get get the weight back up um, prior to the season started and, and yeah, take care of business. Are we, uh, is this like Marshawn Lynch days? Yeah, yeah. So we had a good run. My my 
freshman year. So it would have been like Kyle Bowler and sure. uh, Joel Egber, Joe Chimondu, and then uh, transitioned into JJ Arrington, who's a 2000 plus yard rusher, played with the Cardinals and a few other teams. Yeah. And then my junior year was, I think, Marshawn and, and JJ. And then senior year would have been Marshawn and Justin Forsett. Justin went on and played yeah. for a long time. And then Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Jackson. I mean, we had pretty good squad during that, that run of Cal football. I think it's still the most winningest uh, in recent history, uh, the, the time that we were there. So Yeah, that's amazing, man. Those are some guys. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You know, I know you, as a walk-on, did you have opportunities to play elsewhere on a full ride? So, you know, my, my options coming out of high school, because I was labeled as a, a tweener, sure. um, were – more limited than I had expected. So I started as a, a quarterback and linebacker junior year, led the team to CIF championship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then senior year was kind of playing, you know, they were starting to throw me in a little bit at tailback because they were trying to decide what we would do as an offense. You know, I scrambled a lot as a quarterback and then was still starting at, at linebacker. So about two games into uh, maybe two and a half games is at halftime, one game uh, senior season, they said, okay, we're making a switch. You're going to go in that tailback and, you know, boom, I was <laughs> in this new position and, and, you know, I ended up, leading the county and, and rushing, getting back to um, CIF championship game. We'd lost to the team we beat the year before, but um, really had, you know, great uh, high school career, both sides of the ball in a few different positions. But I think with college scouts looking at me, you know, I was kind of undersized mm-hmm. uh, for linebacker, not fast enough for, you know, D1 tailback and unproven, I guess, as a quarterback. So a lot of those D1 offers that I thought would be there just didn't come. And so I was kind of, faced with that choice of do I go to JUCO first or do I go to like a smaller one double A or or maybe just go like Ivy League and you know football is just kind of secondary to education and um, really wanted to play at the highest level my dad had played football at Michigan State it's something I always kind of looked up to and and wanted to do for myself and um, you know the opportunity to walk on uh, really presented itself and said, you know, you know, if I believe in myself enough, then why not? You know, I, I played against a lot of these guys that are now at USC, at UCLA, all over the mm-hmm. country who are getting, you know, the red carpet, <laughs> carpet treatment. Uh, where's my offer? I guess I guess got to go, go earn it now. So, um, and I did, you know, but yeah, that's it was definitely challenging, definitely frustrating, definitely a lot of soul searching and wondering whether you are good enough to, to go on and play at the next level. And, you know, everybody is kind of saying, ah, oh, you don't want to walk on, you know, it's like an impossible scenario and all that, but having, you know, a really good support system with my family and, and just kind of looking at myself in the mirror and um, deciding what I wanted to do was uh, the ultimate factor for choosing that route. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, obviously it worked out for you. I mean, what an amazing run and so many great teammates. Uh, you, you got a chance to, to play at the next level, similar situation, right? It wasn't like you were drafted, uh, right. You're, you're, you're invited to a camp. You're, you know, you gotta, you gotta figure it out. Um, you know, how was that experience? Yeah, it was tough, right? The same thing. You know, I think coming out, I was touted as like one of the top fullbacks, Full backs, but you know, the the game was changing so much, mm-hmm. especially at the NFL level at that time, right? So you really teams were going away from this, you know, traditional like I form offense where you know two backs in the backfield and it is just more, you know, run and shoot, spread them out, you know. <laughs> you know, really went away from the fullback position. So not every team had a fullback mm-hmm. for one. And even the teams that carried a fullback may only have one on the roster and one on the practice squad. Um, and so I think there's only one fullback that was drafted um, my year and then, you know, a handful signed in free agency. And so draft kind of comes and goes. You're, you know, again, disheartened and like, you know, unsure what the future, if there's, you know, still future in football for you, but luckily got a call by the Bengals, um, you know, after the, the draft is done and opens up into free agency, they, Hey, you know, you want to be a Bengal. Yeah. Like, let's Jeez. do this. And then, you know, you're on a plane uh, shortly thereafter and you're, you know, back in the same position, right. Trying to prove yourself and battling and just trying to get, you know, snaps and, and show what you can do. Um, 
but yeah, it's always, you know, at that level, they're making cut downs constantly. You're always looking over your shoulder and <laughs> unsure whether you're going to have a job the next day. And that's, that's a pretty tough, you know, place to be. It's pretty unsettling, but it also drives you to really, you know, put in the work and, and, um, you know, give it everything you've got. And that's all you can really do at the end of the day. Um, you know, the decisions out of your hands so you can only, you know, put the best on your field and, and, see what happens so absolutely so you were you uh did you make active roster or practice squad guy i know you bounced around for a couple of years yeah so i was in cincinnati there's two first year there's two of us in in camp and i was taking um the starter it was pretty much inactive throughout training camp so me and the other guy that they brought in were you know splitting reps back and forth they ultimately cut me kept him um you know he was about 260 plus i was you know 240 maybe yeah. on a good day right so that uh, I guess being undersized was always something of a challenge at that that level. But later in the season, I uh, had a few other tryouts, uh, one with the Vikings. Uh, they ended up signing the guy. The Vikings signed the guy who's on Cincinnati's practice squad. Cincinnati calls me back. I go on their sure. practice squad and then um, basically kept that job on their practice squad throughout that season. And then the following year, I was basically taking – all the reps in training camp because same situation the fullback reported to camp out of shape overweight so he wasn't medically cleared to even participate in camp and so you know dog days of summer i'm literally running sideline to sideline <laughs> switching jerseys during you know the scrimmage days and just killing myself trying to you know show that i deserved to be there and really wanted to to be the guy um and so because the guy was on a big contract they had just like redone his deal i think a year prior you know he was he was the investment right so i was the insurance policy and um basically sat on the practice squad for that whole next year and after tears of doing that you know it's you know i wasn't in it to just be you know on the practice squad i really wanted to be you know the guy and and so i declined an offer to extend the contract there um just because i didn't think that things would change based off what mm -hmm. i had seen you know in that experience and so entered into free agency ultimately signed with the chiefs and then uh battled it out throughout spring ball and, and into summer camp with um some other guys it was down to you know me and one other kid the job, a um, little bit of nepotism worked against me. He was a Georgia Tech guy, first year coaching staff, running backs coach, and OC, both out of Georgia Tech, brought their tight end, pulled back in. And so, you know, I was kind of up against a, a pretty tough scenario and didn't work out. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much that. I got all my stuff, drove back to California and just, you know, tryouts kind of came and went. But it was really, if you're not on the roster as a fullback, to start the season it's pretty tough to to land somewhere and so that's what kind of started i guess the transition into thinking about life after football i really went into the nfl with like a three to four year timeline of being where i wanted to be with it or moving on and um putting my education to use i didn't really envision you know just being this career road warrior um yeah. for a decade or, or whatever so but uh I did have a, a quick stint in Italy post NFL, which is a great opportunity to just kind of play for the love of the game again and, and really help transition away from the sport on a better tone because it was pretty tough. I, I felt like I'd done everything to earn the job and it didn't result with what I thought was the outcome. Um, you know, all the scouts told me that I outperformed the other guy and this and that, but just, yeah. you know, <laughs> didn't, the same model didn't work. You know, and so, you know, I just kind of left scratch my head of what I should do and, and really took a lot of, you know, I guess, the love for the game uh, out of it for me. Yeah. I mean, look, the game ends for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. It's, a, it's eventually going to end. And uh, there's, you know, a small percentage of people that truly, truly have the game end on their own terms. I mean, most most yeah. most people, the game ends for you. Right. You know, you you might still want exactly. to play, especially if you're a guy in your 20s. Right. It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to you know, continue to play in the NFL and collect those paychecks. It's like oh, nobody signs you and you kind of hang out. For yeah, a season that's it. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So real quick, let's talk about Italy. Um, I, I, I know you went over there, you played a season, uh, which I find fascinating. I think I heard you talk about you were a two-way football, playing offense and defense, kind of like old school Ironman stuff. But uh, I, I, 
at least from my understanding, that was really where sort of your view of food changed in a lot of ways, just the, the eating habits and, and how people treated food over there. And it's really kind of translated into, you know, what your company is today. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, post NFL, I no longer needed to be 240 plus pounds. And really, I wasn't able to play both sides of the ball at that weight, right? So it was both personal transformation where, you know, I didn't feel amazing carrying that much weight around, you know, body hurt a lot more. And just, um, you know, there's other, you know, health related outcomes and issues as a result of consuming that amount of animal protein and other stuff that I was uh, fueling my body with. And so it's really that, I guess, personal journey and, and physically transform my body to be able to play abroad in Italy, both sides of the ball, but also seeing firsthand the way that the Italians kind of lived and ate and how different and contrasting that was to, you know, what we've, you know, come to adopt as the standard American diet and um, really, you know, their approach being more plant centric, more localized approach to food, very prideful about being able to make the food and, and where the food comes from. Whereas the U.S., it's largely convenience based. It's, you know, franken foods that aren't necessarily healthy nor nutrient rich, which is also obviously put us in the, the portion of health that we largely have in the U.S., a lot of the chronic lifestyle related um, diseases that we suffer from, which are easily preventable simply by changing the way that we fuel our bodies. So that was definitely a catalyst and then got magnified when I ultimately uh, started working professionally in the field of nutrition, started in uh, bariatric nutrition. So medical field of, of weight loss and weight loss surgery. Um, was working for you know a world-class company that really took a, a functional-based approach to nutrition and uh, really worked side-by-side with a lot of the, the uh, best um, weight loss surgeons in the country to um, integrate the nutritional component to their practice because it's so pivotal and, and important for positive patient outcomes to have that uh, nutritional part dialed in both preoperatively and postoperatively. And it was really during that time where I had an aha moment that saw a lot of the same nutritional deficiencies that, you know, that patient population was experiencing were also prevalent in just, you know, the general population. Um, And so, you know, with my sports background and now this, you know, professional background in in education, I wanted to create a um, better way of fueling your body that started with real whole foods, um, was 100% plant-based and still offered that level of convenience that, you know, we all need as busy entrepreneurs and, you know, just business people and, and, you know, families that are constantly on the go in, in, you know, uh, American society. And, you know, say plant-based, initially my mind goes to like, oh, vegan, you know, but you eat meat. You're, you're not, a, you're not mm-hmm. against eating meat. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's really more the dairy side of where a lot of the, the different kind of proteins that came out of there were whey based versus, you know, what, what I think your product is, is more plant-based. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's, our approach is not to demonize any particular food group, sure. right? We go back to how food is, is source how it's made how it's processed right so even you know if you're talking about steak right the steak from you know a cow that's you know on organic natural pastures being fed a natural diet is humanely slaughtered is going to have a very different uh nutritional um chemistry than an industrial feedlot cut of beef mm-hmm. one is very high in inflammatory fatty acids omega-6 fatty acids one is actually beneficial and higher in omega-3s Right. So it's all those things that I guess factor in to determine if something's healthful or or not. Um, But yeah, largely in the dairy industry and what, you know, I'd always been accustomed to using, which was whey protein. It was kind of this lie that we've all been fed as athletes and and population that we all need, you know, dairy to be big and strong and healthy bones. And, you know, none of it's true right we don't need it um it's actually as an athlete for performance and recovery uh it's actually contra indicative to um accelerated recovery and it's largely missing all the uh, in void of like all the phytonutrients and anti antioxidant powers that you get from plants and so you're starting to see you know uh, an awakening of athletes and starting to understand when you look at you know that marginal percentage increase of performance and how impactful that could be to, you know, one, your own personal output, but two, a potential competitive advantage, 
that's why more athletes are kind of turning on to the benefits of more plant centric approaches and really rethinking how they fuel their bodies. Right. And I think, you know, that can be applied also to much larger, you know, general population, you know, as an entrepreneur, right. If you want high levels of productivity, you've got to have consistent energy levels, high Mm -hmm. brain power. Right. And that all goes back into how you're feeling your body, but also like those other lifestyle factors that allow you to do that uh, at a high level day in and day out. Yeah. I mean, what's, I'm curious to hear that. Like, yeah, obviously, uh, eat, eating the right types of food, uh, the way it's going to maybe, uh, you know, handle like your, your gut health. And we talked about, you know, you talk about inflammation, uh, we talked about body mass density. I mean, all those things obviously make sense. I think people will connect right away with that, but how about like mind, right? Like, you know, you think about entrepreneurs out there, people who, you know, for the most part are sitting behind desks and making decisions and having to make some nap decisions and come up with new ideas. I know myself, if I've had like a bad weekend with buddies and maybe had too many drinks or whatever it is, like Monday morning, I come in and it's like brain fog, right? Where, yeah. you know, when I've been taking care of myself and working out and doing all those types of things, I, I feel really sharp. Is there some science behind that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the largest consumer of carbohydrates is, is the brain, right? Like, so the brain is typically fueled by carbs. We need carbohydrates rich foods to, you know, to contribute to mental acuity and sharpness and all that. Right. And then, you know, the experience that we've all had about going and having a a massive weekend, right. And then trying to think that we're going to come in and, and, you know, just perform at a high level on Monday, like, no, you're completely a mess, right. You've depleted your body of a lot of the micronutrients, right. You've been, it's been working over time. You've definitely uh, interrupted your sleep patterns, right. And haven't gotten that deep REM sleep. So all these things in combination, I uh, can either have an uplifting, you know, benefit or a very, you know, inhibiting benefit on your, your overall output, right? But I think that the best takeaway is what is the things doing your, your daily habits, right? On and how they contribute to work for your performance levels or against it. Because it's very easy to get you know stuck in that vicious cycle where yeah. you're, you know drinking to go to sleep because you think it helps you sleep better, but then you're guzzling a bunch Mm -hmm. of caffeine the next day. And then, you know, you're probably not exercising, which is probably more for the brain than it is for the body oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, until you're out of that and you're able to really see firsthand how impactful like clean eating and getting enough rest and being, you know, exercising your brain through meditation or mindfulness or just, escaping work, right, to go exercise or whatever that might be, doing that on a daily basis, how um, that can level up your performance over the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. And, not, and, and so you don't burn out too, right? You have to prioritize, you know, taking care of yourself. Otherwise, you're just going to hit a wall and, you know, it's like an injury. It's like breaking your jaw, right? <laughs> You've got this yeah. massive setback now that, you know, um, you could have avoided the injury, you would have been able to continue to make, you know, micro improvements. Whereas now you're like thrown way back, um, you know, to the starting point. So, which is so important to that, you know, that, that high performance mindset that I think so many athletes have. And, and quite frankly, to be a successful entrepreneur, you sort of have to have, uh, as you transitioned out, of sports and you move into your professional world and, you know, you're working and you're kind of getting associated with this, I'm assuming nutrition is something that's always been important to you and just fueling your own body professionally. What was that decision like to, you know what, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start my own company because it's, it's hard to do, right? It's, it's risk. You're, 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 I don't know if you're, had you paid yourself, how much money you had to invest? Did you bring in investors? Um, you know, what, what was that transition like? I mean, you're moving from the sports life to now you're just kind of an employee of a company, sort of a cog in the wheel to like, now, you know what, I'm going to bet on myself again. Let's start this thing. Yeah. I mean, great question and, and super challenging process. And I think because I had gone through it as an athlete, I was more prepared to do it, you know, later in life um, to go and down the path of entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. right? But I think the biggest challenge, the biggest transition is having, you know, that sports career just end and saying, okay, what, what next? Right. And you, you can be as prepared, you know, I I thought I prepared 
uh, a lot, a lot more than a lot of my peers did to try to get exposure to, you know, different careers and soak up the knowledge of different mentors and stuff and take advantage of opportunities that are available. But in reality, nothing really prepares you mentally for, for what lies ahead and having to kind of redefine, you know, that who you are in that next chapter mm -hmm. in life. Um, but yeah, I had kind of had a taste of success, you know, post football professionally. Right. But as you said, I was kind of a, you know, I was a cognitive wheel. I was, a, you know, a guy on the team, but I wanted to be, you know, the star player. I wanted to go and, and really do this on my own. And so it was after kind of, I guess, following to a rhythm of like making good money, but having, I guess, complacency and not enough like challenge, yeah. right. Um, professionally that said, well, you know, maybe there's, a way to do this differently, or maybe there's another opportunity and kind of had this inclination that was this, you know, gut feeling that I want to go out and, and do it, or at least try it on my own, but still a very scary situation because you don't know where the income is going to come from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think you're prepared for it, but you know, you're never really as prepared as, <laughs> you know, you think you are. Right. And so, you know, we, we bootstrapped the company, my co-founder and myself, um, you know, he, put a little bit more capital in, I put more sweat equity in and, you know, we really didn't know what we were doing. So there's a lot of stuff that you just kind of figure out as you go, but it's, you know, um, you just keep showing up day in and day out, you fix one problem, another one shows up. Um, but, you know, I think the, the discipline was certainly there. The idea, like I spent, we spent probably two years just like, product formulation and business mm -hmm. development before even launching the company. So the foundation and the why behind what we were doing was pretty sound. Um, and that's what I think got us through those um, really tough times is being able to fall back on the reason why we started the business in the first place. Um, and then for me personally, leaning on those tough times as an athlete and reminding myself that yes, this is hard, but maybe it's not as hard as the dog days of summer, double days, you know, waking up with a pounding headache and having to go hit a linebacker in the mouth for, you know, yeah. 90 minutes and then do it all over again later that afternoon. Plus, you know, all the other stuff that comes along with being, you know, an athlete at that level. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's never easy, but, you know, I think, you know, I've really embraced and enjoyed the, the journey of it all, right? It's not, you know, I think that's, again, like the athlete's journey and the entrepreneur journey are very closely aligned because it is the journey where you get the most mm -hmm. gratification. It's not necessarily, you know, holding the trophy at the end. Yes, that's a huge moment. Yes, that's incredible, but it's so special because of all the work and, that you put in right. behind the scenes and all those really challenging times where you want to give up every single day but find a way to power through it um, that gets you one step closer to, you know, that, that milestone. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You brought, you brought that up about, <clears throat> you know, as hard as, as hard as it is, it's not as hard as pounding your head and some linebacker, you know, 35 times uh, yeah. <laughs> in a row. And I, I remember having a conversation with a, a teammate of mine. I, I played college football and we were, you know, young in our careers and we were talking about work or whatever it was. And he, and he basically made a comment to me and he's like, dude, this is like so easy. He's like, after the stuff yeah. like we had to deal with, like people get, get nervous about having to show up and like give a presentation. Like how, how easy is it yeah. to give a presentation? Like what we had to deal with. And <laughs> I, I, I think there's a lot of, that, a lot of truth to that. There's, a, there's definitely some, some tempering that, that happens in the, in the athletic world. Um, yeah. Just curious. I mean, it's hard not to think about this. And I'm, I just kind of where your head is. I've, I've asked a lot of, Ex players like yourself, uh, you know what their thoughts are about their kids. Because I get asked that a lot from from friends who have kids that are, you know, you, would you let your son play Pop Warner? And I have two daughters, so it's not something I actually ever have to answer myself. But with head injuries, and I mean, I, I was a offensive lineman, so I banged my head against linebackers all day long too. Uh, you know, what, what are your feelings about that? I mean, it, would you, would you let your son play football? Or I mean, do you think that the positives outweigh the potential negatives? Yeah, it's tough to say. So I don't, I don't have kids yet, but, um, and maybe, you know, this thinking will change when I do, but 
for me, it's definitely something that my mom was aware of and tried to prevent me from playing because my dad had so many, you know, really bad injuries. Um, he played ball at Michigan mm-hmm. State and then, you know, really couldn't play beyond that because of, you know, some of the damage he had done to his back and knee and <laughs> you name it, right? And so I think she was really scared for me to go through that, but I really pushed. And I think it was like back to Junior All American where I said, Well, you're not going to tell me not to play. I want to play. Yeah. I'll raise the money if I have to. I'm going to do this. Right. And so I think it's, you know, and I think I'd probably take a similar approach and, and do the best I can to educate kids about the potential risks. But it's something if that's, you know, really what they want to do, you know, at the end of the day, it's really tough to, you know, not allow them to do it. Um, I think that's really one of the best things that we want to do as parents is really you know, expose them to a lot of different things, you know, not just football, but, you know, different mm-hmm. activities and different things and, and kind of let them choose what their path is. And if it's football, great. You know, if it's something else, great too, right? Um, but not necessarily force them down that path and, and also not completely take it away from them either. But it is tough because I have had, you know, close friends who, going through that now Mm -hmm. and suffering and it's you know it's it's sad and it's you know scary um and but you know i don't know a lot of times you ask guys too like would you trade the experiences you had as a football player as an athlete the relationships like some of my best relationships were with those guys that i played college football with right still are to this day uh, this day you know it's tough to you know those life experiences that you wouldn't necessarily trade for anything so i think it's a, it's definitely a challenging one but um i think it really depends on like the motivation of the kid and, and definitely not something that i'm going to force upon them yeah yeah the kid the kid thing's interesting it's uh it's i think it's different than even you know when, when i grew up and when you know even when you grew up now where i'm dealing with now i have an 11 year old and eight year old daughter and they're both very athletic and they're into sports and, you know, we're trying to expose them to as, as many things as we can, very similar to yourself. And, uh, they want you to specialize and you become like a one athlete, you know, a one sport athlete and you play year round. And, it, and it's like, I'm so against it. I grew up, I was a baseball, basketball, football player, season ended, moved to the next sport. You know, I was playing every other thing I could and play volleyball. Like it was like, whatever I could do. And now it's like, no, no, you're, it's like year round club sport. That's all you do. And I just, I think you're going to burn kids out. I just don't agree with that. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's tough because you're seeing that professionalization of, you know, kids and athletes at a younger and younger level. Right. And I think that takes a lot of the joy and the love of just, you know, pure competition um, and the purity of sport away. Right. And I was the same way, you know, you did it all. You kind of, found what you liked, found what you didn't like, you know, maybe you're great at something and you still didn't, yeah. <laughs> didn't like it. Like for me, I was a great swimmer. I uh, won, you know, won all the stuff, but then it's just like, oh, this is kind of boring. You know, it's not, you know, my speed. And it's like, I was done. I was moving on to focus on something, something else, but I was exposed to so many different activities, both athletically, educationally, and, and extracurricularly that you, you know, you're able to kind of choose the, the path that you want to, go down whereas now it's like no you gotta pick so early but the reality is you don't know you know what you want to really be that young and i don't think you should really have to make that decision that early on in in life right yeah Um, so agreed yeah it's tough so you're you're obviously uh a a talk the talk walk the walk guy right i mean you have a company uh very purpose driven um Love, love what you're doing, but, but you're also, you know, someone who obviously works out, takes very good care of themselves. What's, what's like your routine as a, as, as a CEO, as a founder, obviously you're busy, you're doing shows like this, you're out on the road, you're, you're, you're managing (laughs) manufacturing team, distribution, sales channels. Um, You know, how do you find self time for yourself? You know, what, what kind of stuff do you do to work out and stay, stay in shape? Yeah, I think the first thing is you have to make yourself a priority. Otherwise, it's just never going to happen, right? So my biggest thing is trying to um, carve out that time in the mornings. That's just for me, right? So that means being protective around calendar, not scheduling you know, certain things in that morning that would interfere with my uh, morning routine, right? Because I know when that morning routine gets thrown off, my entire day can go sideways very easily because I'm not in control. I haven't had those like small micro wins Mm -hmm. for the day. Now, 
Uh, that doesn't mean I'm like always super regimented about, okay, I need to work out at, you know, first thing in the morning, you know, depends on where I'm at, what's going on at that point in time. Like I'm back over in Italy now. Um, and so I've got that, you know, time difference where it's a bit easier to take care of that stuff in the morning yeah. when I'm back in like in California, let's say. I might be working out in the afternoons or something, right? So it just depends, but having flexibility around that, but still knowing that, okay, this time block, I'm still going to meditate every morning. I'm going to have that time to just kind of flow into the day um, before letting, you know, everybody else's priorities and agendas take over my schedule. So I think that's important in, in trying to kind of block out, at least on Monday, kind of more time that's just, you know, not you know scheduling too much yeah. stuff because a lot of stuff just kind of over the weekend builds up and then ultimately lands on my plate anyway so knowing that and, and being smart about like how we're prioritizing that but you know there's there's also just so much that's beyond your control and, and knowing that and you know having to be patient with timelines and all that stuff because there's so many different things that you're constantly trying to juggle and manage and Yes, ideally everything would sync up and flow, you know, in time, but it's, it doesn't, <laughs> rarely does it actually happen that way, especially, you know, if the past year or two has taught us anything that we're not, we're not in control of all of this, right? That's right. And supply chains and the pandemic and everything else, right? So, um, yeah, I think our biggest thing is like still, you know, being confident about what we're building, being patient in that process, being smart about our financials and, knowing that we don't need to get to where we're trying to go overnight, right? Like, let's continue to, you know, keep those fundamentals in place, prioritize our own, you know, health and well-being, and still make, you know, big strides toward accomplishing yeah. what we want to achieve. So I, I don't want to gloss over this. You just mentioned you're in Italy now. Do you, I mean, do you have a house out there or is there, are you out there just on vacation? So I'm in the, the process of um, pursuing dual citizenship through Italian bloodline. Yeah. So yeah, prior to the pandemic, so my wife is Brazilian. We'd gone down to Brazil for a wedding celebration. Didn't have any travel planned or anything planned for that matter beyond the um, the wedding celebration. We wanted to get to Bali for our honeymoon, uh, but we just kind of let cheap flights and Airbnbs around the world kind of guide that that travel. And so we flew from like Brazil to Portugal, went through Europe, France, Italy, Greece, okay. ended up getting to Bali. This is all pre-pandemic. We were in, uh, I think, Vietnam when stuff started to come out of China. Mm -hmm. So we circled back to Thailand, got to Australia, landed in New Zealand like two weeks before they shut down the borders and we we're like stuck in New Zealand for a year. Um, and it was really during that time, right, this exposure, I think that the first time I lived abroad in Italy, it was something I already started to try to get that dual citizenship mm -hmm. because the um, Italian national team wanted me to play for them. But the only way I could do that was to have my Italian, you know, citizenship. So it was something that I had been working on for quite some time, but my wife also has um, Italian ancestors. So now we've gone through the process together. So we're living here in Sardinia last summer, just flew back after the holidays to kind of wrap things up and we want to be able to you know decide how much time we want to spend in europe yeah. um probably spend more time in portugal and then split time with the us we also want to you know expand the business internationally so all that is kind of a factor in in those decisions sure. um, and i just i think it's you know i like the pace of life here it's you know helps keep me grounded and and having that i guess contrast and perspective to when we are back in the us how quickly things tend to move and, and how I guess uh, it can be challenging to keep up with some of these you know, other routines. Yeah. That's so cool, man. So uh, you got locked out of the U S you were literally stuck in New Zealand for a year. Like you not by choice necessarily, but like COVID hit and you guys couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> so it was tricky, right? Because my, my wife was undergoing her green card. So through, marriage like we had started that process a year before so but it was everything got lumped together it used to be family green card stuff and like work stuff was two separate things i think um trump combined them all into one office which slowed down the process mm -hmm. but prior to travel we didn't have she didn't have it yet but we already had the wedding plan and it was mm -hmm. kind of like well what, what do we do we thought we would go down there and come back and finish up the process fortunately we got the interview date like a week before we were scheduled to fly out. So we rearranged all of our plans last minute, 
was able to get the documents we needed to leave the country. But fast forward to, I guess, was a year and a half, two years later, because she wasn't supposed to be out of the country for more than, I guess, a year, um, they essentially revoked her green card status. And so mm. I could have gone back, but I'm obviously not going to leave my wife, wife in a yeah. foreign country on her own. And so we're kind of in the state of limbo. Um, but at the same time, we weren't in a huge rush to get home either because yeah. of everything that was going on, you know, back home and uh, New Zealand was basically COVID free. So we were loving it. You know, we were traveling all around the country yeah. and really, you know, maximizing, um, uh, the time there. But, uh, yeah, it's been quite the journey sorting through like so all cool. the residency and citizenship stuff and lots of paperwork and COVID tests and <laughs> different, you know, country requirements and all that. But um, it's been a blessing. And the whole time you got a, you know, you get a strong internet connection, uh, a, a laptop, yeah. and a phone, and you can run a business. Yeah. And like, that's really, you know, when we um, set up the business, you know, it wasn't necessary to prepare for a global pandemic, but we wanted to have the flexibility to manage it remotely. Right. So we put that foundation in place to start making sure we had like good partners that would help kind of run a lot of the back end of the business and, each of those kind of things are their own businesses, you know, in and of themselves from manufacturing and, and sourcing to fulfillment and all that. Right. And so with the advancements in, you know, technology and really the explosion of like direct consumer commerce mm -hmm. and all this stuff now makes it easier to do that from a, I guess, a location uh, being location uh, independent um, and able to, to manage it all, you know, remotely essentially. I, I, I think I read somewhere, it might have been on your LinkedIn, that you said success is the ability to live your lifestyle by design. Uh, yeah. is, 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 that, is that sort of what you mean? It's just that ability to like, hey, I'm going to travel where I want, live where I want, you know, work when I want. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and when it's not serving you anymore, be okay to, to go in a new direction, right? Yeah. And I think that happens, you know, in business and in life, right? Like, you know, you might grow out of whatever it is you're doing career wise now, and there might be something else and, and not ever being afraid to, I guess, redefine what that is and, and, you know, when it is. But yeah, I think that balance of being able to prioritize, you know, the, the quality of life and if something's not serving you, be bold enough to, to change it and put yourself into a situation that really fulfills you. I, you know, I, th I think it's something that as Americans in general, uh, we need to put more emphasis on the culture of global travel. Uh, I know myself, I mean, I didn't do any real global travel outside of, you know, Mexico and Canada until, you know, after I graduated college. And, uh, you know, I know that having the chance to spend time throughout Europe and then, you know, different parts of Asia, like it just opens your eyes up to the, to the world and, you know, helps give you different perspective uh, that the world is just so much bigger than America. I, I think sometimes maybe it's just part of like the nationalism of being American, you know, we're the center of the world, we're the greatest and everything else kind of takes a second. And you get out in the world and you realize like, well, you know, the world's doing pretty well on its own and, you know, we're, we're part of it for sure. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that that's, that's important. I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that or how, you know, having the opportunity to, to have traveled as much as you have and, and live in all these different cultures kind of changed your perspective on how you run your business on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, most other cultures philosophy is different right? We, they don't live to work. They work to live, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different approach. You know, Italians, I know they get like basically the whole month of August off. It's vacation time. A lot of them will go to the United States or to other places around the world. Same thing with Australia, New Zealand, and many countries, right? They get really proper and ample amounts of time to not just travel, but, you know, I think soak up the culture and feel like what it's to live in a new place. And I think one that teaches you so much um, that can be applied to just business in life in general and, and can often open your eyes up to new opportunities that could be applied back to the U.S. or vice versa, right? A lot of times, you know, um, because the pace of technology and everything else in the U.S., there's a lot of businesses that, you know, can be easily applied elsewhere that aren't as competitively saturated as they might be in the, in the U.S., right? So um, I just think it teaches you so much. It definitely um, 
challenges you um, and, and from a personal development side and like figure it out yeah. <laughs> side, especially when it's like a non-native language or something like that. You just, you got to find your way through it. But um, when you do, it just makes you stronger and, and a better overall person. And, and just, again, having that uh, more global perspective, which I think everybody needs to have you know, this day and age, right? It's not just, you know, America isn't everything, right? There's different cultures, there's different, you know, um, things going on in the world that I think we all need to be a bit more mindful and attuned to. Yeah, I, I I think it's awesome, and I uh, I always have so much respect for people who are willing to do things like that because it's so easy to sit back and make up a thousand excuses for why not. You know, ah, uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to make money? How am I going to work? And da 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 da. And I got family. I friend. And it's like uh, there there's some quote and. Uh, like a Mark Twain quote or something like that. And it's not the extent of like, when you look back on your life, you're going to regret the things you didn't do way more than you you know, will the things you do. And um, I had a good buddy of mine who was, was you know, uh, very successful, was uh, in tech, had a really high paying job, a big company. And he just decided that he was going to go travel the world. Just like, just I'm leaving. I, you know, he got one of those yeah. tickets. You can go as many flights as long as I think he had like one direction <laughs> and like yeah. sold his possessions and it saved up the money. And, you know, I think the plan was originally to go for a year and, you know, it extended out to, you know, 18 plus months and, and, and he just did it. And, uh, I, you know, I know when he came back and it was just like life changing for him, but there's a million reasons why people don't do things like that. Right. A million excuses for not doing it, but it's like, who, who's going to ever regret that? No, never. And I, I think, you know, it's so freeing once you do it, similar situation to us, like we you know, packed up all of our stuff, like put it in storage, didn't think twice about it, like thought that, you know, we were at a time we were holding on to, you know, this apartment where we were living in Newport and we thought it was like the best thing ever and life was great. But then we left and like none of it was planned. We didn't have, you know, any, you know, idea what would unfold and what would happen. But it was like the most freeing thing ever. I think the most I think tied down we were was I still had my car back in the states and I was paying like yeah. a monthly lease on it or something. It was like, geez, this is a big pain in the ass, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which I could offload it. And I had it on like Turo or something, and ultimately um, somebody actually crashed it or something. Oh, but Jesus. I got a check for it, and so I was kind of out of that additional burden, which is you know kind yeah, of a blessing. blessing yeah. In disguise, it was a pain. It was a pain to manage all that from overseas right and everything else but it ultimately you know it was totally freeing as a result but you're, you're spot on like we had so many friends that you know i think got married around the same time they said they wanted to go do a honeymoon and then there's like one excuse after another would mm -hmm. pop up and here we are you know five years later they never did it never probably are going to do it right because there's always some excuse um that, that holds you back and it, it never gets any easier, right? There's always going to be some excuse. It's just saying, oh, you know what, screw it. I'm going to, you know, give it a shot. And what's the worst case? What's the worst thing that could be happening? Worst case usually is you're back right where you yeah. were before you left. So what, right? And you still have this amazing, you know, experience or story to tell. And at least the confidence piece of mind that said, you know what, I tried, you know, I, I did it, you know, and so, so what? Yeah. So what's what's next for Life Fuel? Yeah, so we are in the process of pretty significant brand refresh that we've been working on for over two years. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of exciting uh, new products in development, updated branding, zero waste packaging, um, just kind of doubling down on our core values across the board, getting even closer to our ingredient suppliers and telling that story of where they come from um, with I think that the largest competitive advantage being that everything's going to be a hundred percent whole food source. So like the supplement industry as a whole, most of the stuff is synthetically based, mm -hmm. meaning it comes from petroleum chemicals and mm -hmm. other things. So even like the most healthful stuff that you're seeing out there, when it comes down to the micronutrients on the, the back of the panel, most of them are not made from real whole foods. Um, and so the, uh, by, uh, by availability advantage that we'll have as a result of that and the, the health advantage and all that is just superior to what you'll find anywhere else. So that's really exciting um, that we'll be launching uh, 
probably two, Q2 or Q3 of this year. And hopefully we'll start to awaken the market to a food first based approach to nutrition and, 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 and wellness. Um, and then beyond that, you know, really now that we've kind of got this blueprint dialed in a little bit um, better and got those updated formulations um, uh, remanufactured, we'll look at taking light fuel into interesting new markets, probably Canada being one of the first ones, and then potentially over in Europe. Um, Brazil makes a ton of sense, but still a lot to, you know, kind of um, explore on that front. But we'll probably look for like owner operators that are um, native in those territories that we can kind of um, create a partnership with and, and around to enter those those new markets. What's your what's your primary go to market right now? Are you uh, are you almost all online or do you guys do some some affiliate type stuff or how's that work? Yeah, so um, exclusively online at the moment, we do have affiliates. Um, mm -hmm. That's been actually a great um, you know traffic source for us and, and really great for our affiliate partners because of you know one um, the the retention and quality of our products, but to how much time we put into the website and really optimizing conversion rates and all that. So like when we get traffic actually converts well, yeah. um, which is huge in the, in the affiliate space. Um, but yeah, we dabbled in the, the retail space a bit, but because we're such a, a small team and, and largely remote, it really required a ton of, resources and you know what we found we had like the whole street team and doing in-store demos and all that mm -hmm. it was like a huge thing to manage and you know with covid obviously that went quiet also <laughs> for 12 months plus yeah. Large, luckily we had kind of divested resources in that direction and just decided to focus online um and that's really been the best model for us not that we won't go or entertain retail it's just not something that we're actively chasing at the moment awesome well, look, man, uh, it was great talking to you. I, uh, I appreciate learning a little bit more yeah, about the story. I, I love that you're sitting in Italy right now. Uh, or not Italy. Yeah, right, uh, <laughs> yeah Italy. Italy yeah. Sardinia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, just modern day technology. I'm, I've been in technology for yeah. 20 years and I still like marvel at the fact that we're just having like a real, yeah, real time video conversation. Here. <laughs> so, yeah. but uh, I appreciate it, man. So lifefuel.com, uh, anybody's interested in, in, in finding that? Yeah, life with Y L Y F E F U E L dot com. Um, it's really the best place to to find us. We've got our essential shake on there, and then uh, anybody that's you know kind of looking for a more holistic approach to wellness, we tap into a lot of the things that we touched on today in terms of like mindful living and daily habits that help to optimize both performance and longevity. We've got our transformation program that really helps to lay that foundational framework mm -hmm. to how you can um, do that on a daily basis and see some really um, big wins in a short period of time. Absolutely. Do you, uh, when you think of your, like your target persona, your target customer is, is it, is it that sort of person that's, that's really looking at just kind of like an overall lifestyle change or, I mean, this is like a paleo friendly uh, protein too. So I'm sure it's CrossFit and in that world, it's probably pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, we get it from all over the place. You know, it's really because of the nature and starting with that whole food plant-based approach. Mm -hmm. Like there's one thing that's undeniable is that, you know, the more of those types of fuel sources you keep in the body, the better off you're going to be from a health standpoint, mm -hmm. right? So it's not exclusively vegan. It's not exclusively to keto. It's low carb, so it meets those needs. It's, you know, whole food source, so, it, you know, appeals to the paleo community. So all these, I guess, dietary tribes, yeah. like, can find a benefit from, um, you know, light fuel, our approach to nutrition is just an elevated fuel source yeah. that is going to provide your body with everything it needs. So super clean, starting with real whole food, plant-based um, foods, and then really depending on what your health goals are, um, you can find a place for, for light fuel. So I use it daily really for convenience and peace of mind that I'm getting, you know, my um, daily nutritional values. That's like what our essential shake accomplishes. And then we have for athletes, like a post um, workout performance shake. That's really about accelerating recovery, doing more um, good for the body than you would ever get from like a whey protein shake and, yeah. and all that stuff. So. Awesome, man. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate yeah. you coming on the show, bud. Thank you, Greg. It's been great.